Greetings, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program, How the Brooklyn Bridge Was Built, A Visual History. I'm Marcia Eli, Director of Programs at the Brooklyn Public Library's Center for Brooklyn History. And I'm also part of the library's arts and culture team, BPL Presents, the team that brings you cinema ephemera, climate reads, whispering library, lit films, and so much more. And if you're curious what any of those are, I hope you'll visit our website. So tonight I have the pleasure of welcoming Jeffrey Richman, beloved historian at Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery. Jeff is gonna share with us a visual feast about the Brooklyn Bridge as told in his latest book, Building the Brooklyn Bridge, 1869 to 1883. When Jeff first told me about the publication of this book, his story was as much about his personal passion as a collector, his own tenacious detective work and wild goose chases, as about the building of the bridge itself, which is already one of New York City's greatest stories. So tonight we'll hear how he scoured sources far and wide, how he found these never before published stereoscopes. And we'll also hear about the miracle of this 14 year saga, the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. This is truly a sneak peek because Jeff's book is not out until later in September. But I want to share that we have arranged tonight for your ability to order the book in advance through the community bookstore, which is a local bookshop some 30 blocks from Greenwood. To make that a simple click for you, we're going to put in the chat a link to the community bookstore's webpage for this book, which I believe comes uh, with nifty 3D glasses, but I'm gonna let Jeff talk more about that. <laughs> um, I also wanna share that, that with, as with all the Center for Book and History talks, you have the option to engage closed captioning tonight. Simply click that at the bottom of your screen. And finally, you're all invited to share your questions for Jeff. Type them into the uh, Q&A box throughout the program, also at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I will come back at the end and share as many of your questions as there's time for. So now let me briefly tell you a little bit of Jeff's story and hand it off to him. In 2007, after 33 years of practicing law, Jeffrey Richmond became the full-time historian at Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery. I really can't speak to his passion for law, but as I've said, his passion for being a collector and for 19th century New York history is sort of mind blowing. Um, he has shared this passion by authoring multiple books about Greenwood and other topics by leading historical tours and programs, exhibitions, initiatives at Greenwood. And tonight, we are the beneficiaries of his wealth of knowledge. So Jeff, thank you so much for being here. And I hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marcia, for that lovely introduction. And I think we'll go right to shared screen here. And the Zoom gods willing, I think we're good here. So. Uh, this is, of course, an image from the 19th century of Manhattan, of Brooklyn, of New Jersey, and of the Brooklyn Bridge. And so we all know that the Brooklyn Bridge is a tremendous icon today, and it became an icon very, very quickly. And so this is a coin, a commemorative coin from 1889, the celebration of the centennial of George Washington swearing in as president. And the back of the coin has this uh, new kid on the block here, the Brooklyn Bridge, which was only six years old at the time and is already deemed the eighth wonder of the world. And so many, many commercial enterprises uh, wanted to associate themselves with the bridge very quickly. And this one, I do love this uh, Willimantic spool company with the spools up on the top of the tower here. And of course, today, Knicks versus Nets tonight, 7 p.m. on the Yes Network. And there's the Brooklyn Bridge behind them. 
Uh, certainly, uh, no discussion of the Brooklyn Bridge is complete without a shout out to the Great Bridge by David McCullough, which uh, is now, I believe, 49 years old and is uh, certainly one of my favorite books. I've read it twice. I've listened to it on audio. Uh, I think I'm into my fifth listen through. And every time I listen, I learn something new about New York history and about the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. So I did know after reading certainly McCullough's book, the outlines of the story, the story of the father, John Roebling, the engineer, and his uh, young son, Washington Roebling, also an engineer, and how they built the bridge. And I also knew about the bridge through the centennial in 1983. This is a catalog from the Brooklyn Museum, a wonderful exhibition that they had there. Uh, and so there were exhibitions associated with the 100th anniversary of the opening of the bridge. And there were celebrations also. So this is a print from 1883 when the bridge opened. But this is also the viewpoint that I had in 1983 atop the Eagle Warehouse along Old Fulton uh, Street in Brooklyn. I had friends who had a place in the Eagle Warehouse and was able to be at this spot to watch the fireworks uh, celebrating 100 years later, the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge. And so, uh, I've, for as long as I can remember, been a collector. And so I collected items in 1983. These were restrikes of the original commemorative coins from 1883. And also I was able at a book show to buy the volume of the opening ceremonies of the bridge from May 24th, 1883. And even an invitation to the opening ceremonies with kind of a who's who of Greenwood Cemetery, William Kingsley and Stranahan, the father of Prospect Park, Henry Slocum, a Civil War general, and Albert W. Bailey, this is made out to. And lo and behold, I discovered that Albert W. Bailey is interred at Greenwood Cemetery. And so here's his invitation. And here is a uh, ticket to the opening of the bridge by Tiffany and Company. Of course, Louis Comfort Tiffany and Charles Tiffany are interred at Greenwood. And then I was collecting woodcuts of New York City and of the Brooklyn Bridge. So this gives you some perspective on how huge the towers of the bridge were compared to the kind of skyline to be of Manhattan. And here's another view looking across to Manhattan with some of the recognizable buildings, the Tribune building, the United States Post Office, uh, Trinity Church's steeple. And I was also collecting, starting about 1980, stereo views. Uh, these cards that are about seven inches across that when viewed through a special viewer, you can see in 3D. And here's really a uh, outstanding one from my collection. And I also, early in eBay's history, saw a listing for uh, lantern slides of the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. The uh, person listing that was a television repair shop, as I remember, in Tennessee. They hadn't given very much in terms of the description. And so I decided to take a flyer on this and discovered images I had never seen before, despite years of collecting uh, related material. And so here, this gives you an idea of the anchorage looking down with Manhattan, oops, Manhattan in the distance. And then I happened to meet a uh, collector who had outbid me on a lot of 25 stereo views of the bridge being built. And he agreed to allow me to use his images. And so some wonderful images, the framing for the approach, uh, wooden supports to hold up the granite as, the, uh, as they were setting. And then Jeff Krause, who I have known really since about 1980 as a just 
consummate collector of stereo views. Jeff, to my mind, has the best collection, uh, better than New York Public Library, better than New York Historical, better than Museum of the City in New York. And Jeff agreed to loan me you know, or let me use his images also. And so given this opportunity, it seemed to me that I had no choice but to proceed with this book. And so wonderful uh, sign here from Washington Roebling, safe for only 25 men, do not walk, nor run, jump or trot, break step. He was concerned about the uh, galloping Gertie idea of the bridge starting to oscillate and coming down on itself. And so I also uh, knew Bob Zeller, who's the president as the president of the Center for Civil War Photography. And Bob had published several books with 3D images. And in this book, as you can see from the cover, he just reproduced 3D stereo cards. And then of course the question is how do you view them? And so some of you may, uh, recognize this name, Brian May. Brian May was a member of the rock group Queen and undoubtedly did very well for himself. And he published this book, uh, which was a bit pricey, shall we say, and included this viewer with instructions. So this is kind of like an Ikea project to take this and fold this just right. And then you put it on the page and Bob Zeller very much advised me not to do this. And rather, he told me about a anaglyph maker for Windows, uh, which is free, a program created by a fellow in Japan. And so what you do is you take a stereo view like this and you can reproduce it just as a single image or you can re reproduce it as an anaglyph. And so my book does come with 3D glasses where you can see uh, these images in 3D. And so we have 42 3D images in the book out of 252 images total. And so just spectacular to see this in 3D and get the sense that you are on the top of the tower of the Brooklyn Bridge, looking towards the Manhattan Tower and uh, get that sense of height uh, is to me really spectacular. And so this is a later image from the 1890s of kind of a mix of what looks like an immigrant family and also kind of a uh, kind of Tony family there. And so I also reached out to, I knew Erica Wagner who had written a biography of Washington Roebling, one of the two chief engineers, the son. And this is Erica. And then I, uh, Erica introduced me to Richard Haw, who had written the biography of the other chief engineer, John Roebling. And this is Richard, and you can see very much that Richard is a Brooklyn Bridge enthusiast. I believe he's written three books in connection with the bridge. He's fascinated by the art connected with the bridge. And this is in fact his uh, image on his uh, page as a faculty member of CUNY John Jay. And so you see he does not uh, leave his fascination with the bridge behind. And Richards uh, has this wonderful, wonderful collection of woodcuts, these uh, black and white images that could be reproduced here in fact with no photographer present when this accident occurred as the cables were being spun, uh, a uh, artist could create this and it could be published. And of course, woodcuts were great for these illustrated newspapers because they did not have the technology until 1880, very late in the bridge's construction to be able to reproduce photographs. And so up until then, you had to rely on woodcuts. Uh, this is the table of contents to my book. And so we're gonna track through this now. Uh, you see an image, a uh, essay by Richard Haw, Building the Brooklyn Bridge, one image at a time. And then an essay by Erica Wagner, The Brooklyn Bridge, A Love Story. And then I broke it down into engineers and workers, and then the various stages of the construction of the bridge and the years that those occurred, the caissons and the towers, et cetera. And then I also insisted on an appendix uh, 
honoring the photographers who took the images that we now have to our advantage. And so these are the chapter double page spreads, the engineers, uh, John Roebling and Washington Roebling, father and son. Uh, John Roebling was a very, very interesting character. He was born in Germany. He studied engineering there. Uh, he studied philosophy with Hegel. And he was uh, certainly McCullough labels him a genius. Uh, he fled Germany for the greater opportunities in the United States, established the community of Saxonburg in Western Pennsylvania and declared himself a farmer. However, he soon realized that this was not sufficiently challenging for him. And so he went into the wire rope business, which became tremendously successful. And he also pioneered suspension bridges. And so this is from Scientific American, 1878, a cover of their issue. And what you see here as described, the great suspension bridges of the United States. And so this is the Niagara Bridge by John Roebling. And this is the Brooklyn Bridge by John Roebling. And this is the Cincinnati Covington Bridge across the Ohio River by John Roebling. And this is the Allegheny Bridge by John Roebling in Pittsburgh. And so all of the great suspension bridges by the Roeblings. Here's Allegheny. Here is the Niagara Bridge. And so I just wanted to read to you you can actually make out, if you look carefully, that there are two tiers here. One is for railroad on the top, and then below that is another level, and that is for other traffic. And so I did wanna read the only reading of this presentation, Mark Twain, having experienced the Niagara Bridge, of course, it's always worth quoting Twain. You drive over the suspension bridge and divide your misery between the chances of smashing down 200 feet into the river below and the chances of having a railway train overhead smashing down onto you. Either possibility is discomforting taken by itself, but mixed together, they amount in the aggregate to positive unhappiness. And so Roebling was really the man for suspension bridges in America. Here is the Cincinnati Bridge, which still stands across the Ohio River, now known as the Roebling Bridge. And I think you should be struck by how similar this looks to, on a smaller scale, certainly, to the Brooklyn Bridge. And so this predates the Brooklyn Bridge. This was experience that both John Roebling and Washington Roebling got building this bridge. And the same basic techniques that they used here are those that they used in Brooklyn. And so here to uh, help you out a little bit in terms of understanding what a suspension bridge is, a uh, suspension bridge has towers and the point of the towers is to get the span up high enough that you're not dealing with navigation on the river. And so of course the federal government had some say with this, originally it was supposed to be 130 feet up and then they uh, moved, uh, required that it be moved up to 135 feet. So that's the point of the towers. The cables in turn are what support the superstructure of the bridge, the decking upon which people travel. And then you have the suspenders and the suspenders are the, these vertical lines in this drawing by Courier and Ives. And they are what get attached to the beams that support the, that are the deck of the bridge. And so that's the basic construction. Here is Washington Roebling served in the Civil War, early in the war, he's having dinner with his father, John. And John says to him, I think you've hung around here long enough, time to go off to war. And so Washington Roebling enlists as a private 
And to give you some idea of his leadership abilities and his skill as an engineer, he is discharged four years later as a lieutenant colonel. And so he rose through the ranks. Uh, here he is right about the time he was building the Brooklyn Bridge. He was 32 years old when he built the bridge. And here he is as the bridge construction proceeded. And so his father, in fact, did a good deal of the preparatory work, the drawings for the bridge uh, from 1867 to 69. And then he got himself basically killed by the ferry. In the irony of ironies, he was gonna put the ferries that ran across the East River out of business. And as he was surveying, one of the ferries was coming in and he got his leg crushed between the ferry and a piling and died a very painful death just a few weeks later of lockjaw. And it fell to his son to do the construction. Uh, he got the bends during the course of work in the caissons. He also exhausted himself. And here he is on Columbia Heights in Brooklyn Heights, uh, viewing the bridge at a distance and constro controlling the construction. So the bridge construction lasted for 14 years, 1869 to 1883. Washington Roebling supervised that construction and yet never set foot on the bridge while it was being built, which is really quite remarkable. Uh, here he is in a painting at the Brooklyn Museum, and you see the bridge in the distance. And here is his wife, Emily Warren Roebling, who, when he was physically debilitated, uh, could not sit in a room with light, <coughs> could not engage in a conversation. She became the liaison to contractors. She became the liaison to the assistant engineers who loved her. And so here she is, another painting by, uh, at another painting at the Brooklyn Museum. And so why a bridge across the East River? Here we are, 1750 at the Fulton Ferry. Ferries are running across the bridge because you've got a population center in Manhattan. <coughs> And you've also got a bit of a population center in Brooklyn, but certainly uh, a building population center. And so they're actually, even before Fulton's uh, invention of the steamboat ferry, they have horse powered ferries that are running across the East River. And then uh, 1853, both John Roebling and Washington Roebling are on one of these ferries and they get stuck in the East River because the East River has frozen. And so here's an image of a frozen East River with these ferries unable to uh, get across and people walking across at great peril, some left in great peril, here an article. And so this was unreliable, certainly in winter and limited uh, ability to get people onto ferries and off ferries. And so here is a drawing by John Roebling, 1857. There had been talk as early as 1802 or so about the need for a bridge across the East River. This is John Roebling's sketch for a bridge which he conceived as going across uh, to what we now call Roosevelt Island was then Blackwell's Island. And here is the uh, ferry at, uh, in Brooklyn. And so here, this is a photograph taken with the bridge already under construction, but you can see uh, the slips into which these ferries pulled and where John Roebling would have had his leg crushed and the pilings that were there to absorb the blows from the ferries as they came in uh, on occasion a bit too fast. And so one of the ferries going across, this is the old Pierpont uh, warehouse in Brooklyn, which still stands. And so 
I was able to reach out to three wonderful public archives also. Uh, this uh, is a photograph from the Museum of the City in New York with a key uh, dating in this dates from November of 1872 and shows some of the leaders of the bridge effort. And so E.F. Farrington, the master mechanic, William Kingsley, the superintendent, et cetera, et cetera. Just wonderful detail in these photographs. Another photograph from the Museum of the City of New York with much, uh, several of the trustees here, including Henry Cruz Murphy, uh, several of the assistant engineers, William Payne, who had served with Washington Roebling during the Civil War. They would change out of their uniforms, risking their lives to map the Virginia countryside. And had they been captured, they would have been executed on the spot. William McNulty, uh, one of the engineers also. C.C. Martin, another of the engineers, he was the second in command. And so what we're seeing here is the process of spinning the cables. And what I find to be interesting is if you look closely at C.C. Martin, you see he's got this rather distinctive hat on, a beard, watch fob, vest, and suit. And then this photograph here is the same person, C.C. Martin. And so this led me, after going back and forth and looking at hundreds of images, to conclude that this was all part of one shoot by a photographer by the name of Gustavus Pach, who simply swung his camera a, a bit to the left and got this image. And then the workers. So I thought it was important as part of the book to pay tribute to the men who really uh, built the bridge. Uh, this is a, an absolutely spectacularly laid out photograph. You can see the photographer was able to put three men here to the left of this wooden uh, mast and three men to the right. And he arranged everybody so that the camera could see them and they could see the camera. And here's uh, just how you can pull the detail out of these photographs. Here are those three on threes. Well, actually three on four, I guess it's. Okay, and then uh, some of the men with anchor bars and building the brick vaults that were necessary for the approaches. Here, men at work, they're using a little bit of a uh, car on rails, wooden rails to move things in and out. Beautifully constructed photograph by a stereo photographer who understood the importance of foreground and midground and distance to get a maximum 3D effect. And some more of the workers on the job building the bridge. Here, men inside the caissons breaking apart some of the rocks that they encountered and men cutting these oak timbers to prop up the partitions in the caissons, moving the debris out. And so here is the chapter on the caissons. The caissons were the foundation upon which the towers would rise. These were massive boxes open on the bottom. Uh, you could fit four tennis courts up on top of this. And the, these men here give you some idea of the scale. They were about 162 feet by 102 feet, if I recall correctly. And they were built at a shipyard in Greenpoint and then a shipyard in uh, Manhattan on East 6th Street by the firm of Webb and Bell. And so here is Mr. Webb, Eckford Webb, his gravestone at Greenwood Cemetery, just top the catacombs. And here is the inscription on the back, an eminent shipbuilder and constructor of the caissons for the first Brooklyn suspension bridge. 1893, he died. 
And so this is a man who built many world famous ships and his proudest accomplishment was the caissons for the bridge. So this gives you an idea they used really ship technology here with caulking between these rows of timber uh, and built it on the ways here and then broke the blocks that were holding it in place and slid it right into the East River. This is the New York caisson. So there were two caissons, one for each of the towers and they were towed into place. Uh, the engineers had a pretty good idea by that time as to what they were going to encounter. And so this is a uh, setup to take a core of what you were going to hit as you dug down. The idea was to dig the caisson down, to have men inside the caisson digging away and breaking apart boulders to let the caisson drop into the ground. This was the most massive caisson that had ever built, been built. Washington Roebling and Emily Roebling had gone to Europe uh, at the request of John Roebling to study caissons, which had been pioneered in Europe for mining and also for some bridge work. And Washington Roebling came back as the American expert on caissons, though he had never used them uh, before. And so the question was, as you dug down, what were you going to hit? And here's part of the answer, the, just this beautiful drawing of the uh, bore that they did and the detail that you see. And so you, you begin to see what they're going to be encountering. Uh, sand with mud, sand and gravel, sand and gravel mixed with clay, boulders, and so there were various levels. And of course, one of the problems was that given how massive the caisson was, you might hit bedrock at 20 feet for part of the caisson, but the other part of the caisson might not hit bedrock for another 60 or 80 feet. And so you needed to get to bedrock all across the caisson. Here's one of the preliminary drawings for the caisson. And so you see the workspace down here. You see the timbers, the wood that composed the caisson. There was a iron lip around the caisson, which they had hoped would cut uh, as they went down, but did not, uh, given the huge amount of friction against the caisson. And then here you see the exit and entrance way for the workers to come down this stairway. And so this is actually kind of primitive. What I did see as I went through the materials, and I believe this is actually from the municipal archives. So that was a second of those wonderful archives uh, with the original drawings that uh, were discovered uh, several decades ago. Uh, they had pretty much disappeared in a uh, dusty storage area that New York City owned. And then you see the idea of how these uh, limestones and then granite stones would be piled upon the caisson to push it down and to stabilize it. And the tower of the bridge would rise up above. And so an important point to understand is that these caissons are in fact below the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge to this day. And a wonderful sketch from one of these drawings of the men at work. And this gives you a really good idea of what the caisson was ultimately. Washington Roebling did quite a bit of changing to uh, create the best possible tool uh, as the caisson. And so you see the men working down here and they're working with pick and shovel to remove debris. And what they're doing is undermining the edge of the caisson and letting it slowly move downward. And at the same time, so here are the men with a uh, airlock to keep compressed air inside. And so they're blowing compressed air 
into the work chamber in order to keep the water of the East River out. And at the same time, they need to get the debris out without allowing the compressed air to escape. And so Washington Roebling comes up with this really extraordinary idea, which is to fill these chambers with water and then to drop these clamshell buckets down and to have them grab the debris that has been put into pits below and pull that out. Uh, of course, the trick was if you put too much water into this chamber, it would flood into the work chamber, which you didn't want. And if you didn't put enough in there, the compressed air would blow the water out of the shaft. And so there was a fine balance that was made all the more difficult because sediment would settle out of this water. And therefore one might be in equilibrium at this height and the other one might be in equilibrium at this height. And so made people nervous when they saw the different heights, but that was a function of whether or not there was this sediment making the water that much heavier per uh, cubic foot. So here's a photograph by Robert Talfer, who was a Greenpoint photographer and then engineer, also had served in Duryea Zouaves during the Civil War and became an engineer down in Houston, uh, working on the bayou down there. This is a view, wonderful photograph. You see the caisson is right here. And the materials that they needed to operate the caisson are above it. And you see this house here with these vents for the steam engines. And so this is March of 1872. You see writing along the side here. And I checked with Erica Wagner, who is the world's expert on Washington Roebling's handwriting. And she tells me that this is his handwriting, air compressor house. So this is the uh, house that is pumping through tubes the compressed air into the caisson. And of course, the problem is, as you go farther down, you're dealing with greater volumes of water, and therefore you need more compressed air. And that creates the opportunity for the bends, which they did not understand. Uh, they very much believed that it was the time in the space that would give you the bends, and also whether men were in good shape and whether they were experienced. And of course, it was none of that. It was a question of leaving the compressed air and coming out and nitrogen in your blood then expanding. And so just, uh, I believe this is from uh, RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. They have the Roebling collection up there donated by Washington Roebling with just some extraordinary drawings. And so this is by his father. Uh, John Roebling, of the uh, buckets that would be used to dredge the material, the debris out of the caissons. And here you see a wonderful image of the top of the caisson. And I do love this photograph because it shows you these clamshell buckets, two of them. And it shows you this fellow here seated on a board. And Erica did arrange for an expert on uh, bridge construction to consult with me and kind of give me tips on what I was seeing. And he told me something which I never would have figured out, which is that this fellow is seated here to signal to the steam engine operator who is operating uh, and controlling the height of this clamshell bucket. When the clamshell bucket has reached the bottom of the shaft, he is to wave to the operator to indicate to him not to lower the clamshell bucket anymore. And then you have these derricks, which are there to position the stones that will make up the tower. Here's a little bit better view of the clamshell bucket. And you can see what they're doing is when the bucket comes up, 
They then slide these little cars in there uh, that are on tracks. They drop the debris into these cars. And then what they typically did was they dumped it into the East River and then uh, supposedly came back and dredged that material out of the river. Here's a uh, nice woodcut of the airlock. And so you had to enter and then you sealed it off and you allowed the compressed air to come into the airlock. And then the men, when it reached the same pressure as below, could open up this uh, cover and proceed down into the work chamber. And here are men working at the bottom of the uh, shaft into which that clamshell bucket dropped. And they did have problems. They said that for each two clamshell buckets operating, there were more than that that were not operating because even though they were using steel on the teeth, uh, the material they were encountering, the boulders and the rocks and the clay were sufficient to break those teeth apart. And so here, these men have a very specific job. Uh, debris has been dumped into this pool or pit, which was about six to eight feet deep. And they are stirring it around. What they discovered was if they put material in there, it would harden and then the clamshell bucket couldn't get in there. And so they have this water stream to keep it liquid and they are mixing it up so that the clamshell can grab onto the material. The towers of the bridge, uh, designed by John Roebling. You see, we're looking from Manhattan. The Brooklyn side was the first uh, to start to go up. And then the Manhattan side, here is the ferry and the ferry uh, boathouse over in Brooklyn. And here's a drawing by John Roebling. Uh, Roebling had grown up uh, in Germany, as I mentioned, and had great experience with walled cities. And he wanted this to be an entrance to New York, the city of New York, which was essentially Manhattan, and the city of Brooklyn, which was the third largest city in America. So New York, the largest city, Philadelphia, second largest. And so this was to be a grand entrance uh, whichever way you were going, either to New York or to Brooklyn. And what I do love about these drawings is uh, the character of them. And so you see something that's very difficult to make out here, but if we kind of zoom on that, they have for no apparent reason put a woman holding a parasol there uh, in this illustration. So here is the bottom uh, course of the tower drawn by Washington Roebling. And you see that in fact, the Brooklyn Towers, Brooklyn Bridge Towers as built are hollow inside. But each of these had a specific dimension and then they cut them, the stones down to fit exactly as they wished. Here is the tower going up one of the towers. I think we're on the, yeah, we're on the, New York side, and we can tell that because you see the Brooklyn Tower in the distance, which has risen uh, even farther. And I do love this photograph, which shows, uh, I think this is Silas Holmes, who is buried in an unmarked grave at Greenwood, which I hope to shortly rectify with our unmarked grave project. But Holmes seems to have been an insider with the bridge and to be able to get the man to hang these granite blocks, one, two, three uh, to add to the drama of the photograph. I think uh, this tells me that it was Holmes who was doing this. Here we are the Manhattan Tower close to completion and a number of landmarks, the Harper Brothers building largest publishing company in uh, the world, the shot tower that James Bogardus uh, built Bogardus, the pioneer of cast iron architecture is at Greenwood, the old uh, US postal, uh, post office from 1876, not so old in this photograph and the Tribune building here and St. Paul's Chapel here. And of course, South Street here.
So the tower was this just remarkable uh, structure towering over Brooklyn. I think this is actually Trinity, Holy Trinity Church, which still stands in Brooklyn. But you can see how short the buildings were there. The anchor ridges, and so the point of the anchor ridges were to hold the ends of the cables. And here's a, a photograph from slightly earlier where we had not quite reached the level in the earlier woodcut. And this shows you the anchorage with a huge iron anchor plate to which anchor bars were attached. And as they rose, then the wires of the cables were attached to these. Uh, Washington Roebling had an interesting observation. The practice in Europe was to leave these so that uh, maintenance could access them. And Roebling said that he would not do that with the Brooklyn Bridge, that Americans valued finishing the job and moving on and that he would uh, therefore enclose them in uh, granite. So here are those plates, the iron plates here, four plates per cable. Uh, excuse me, four plates, one for each of the cable and some of the uh, anchor bars as they were going up and the connections between the anchor bars and the wires. Uh, the footbridge was built as a temporary structure to allow the men to stand on these cradles and to monitor the wires as they were being spun. So they, uh, here's a view from the Brooklyn Tower down the footbridge. Here are the cradles that you can see. Uh, and a man was assigned to watch to make sure that the tension on each of these wires uh, that would make up the cable. Uh, so you had about 300 wires per strand and then 19 strands per cable and four cables of the bridge. So thousands of wires making up a cable and tremendously over-engineered. Uh, what was interesting about the footbridge also, you don't see a security guard here to keep the public away. And so you actually could go across this. Uh, it was open to the public for a while and then by permission of uh, Henry Cruz Murphy only, uh, one of the workers commented that women seem to actually do better on the footbridge than the men did. And then wrapping the cables, So here is E.F. Farrington, the master mechanic, demonstrating to his workers that uh, being up high on a wire is not a problem. They created uh, a loop. And from with that loop, they dragged wires across from this shed. And so here you see that same shed on the Brooklyn side. They only dragged wires in one direction. Two spools, massive spools of wire uh, dedicated to each of the four cables. And then this is the carrier wheel to which they attached a loop of wire and pulled it across to the Manhattan side. And then the carrier wheel came back by itself and they attached another loop and continued. So basically the idea of a clothesline, the same loop that you would attach a wire to and move it back and forth. Uh, they also created uh, some rather ingenious ways of connecting wires since of course uh, the wires uh, had to be spliced uh, every uh, 800 feet or so. And so just to share with you a few more images, uh, I am running out of time here. And so this is a wonderful image of the four cables, one, two, three, four, these have yet to be uh, clamped down. These have been clamped down. Uh, Washington Roebling spent much time trying to figure out how to order the various strands. 
And so you can see here, this would be strand number one, et cetera. Then he changed his mind up in here. So really uh, fascinating. This is uh, as they dropped the uh, wi uh, wires onto the saddles that Washington and Roebling spent a great deal of time creating and engineering. And uh, the idea was that the cables, excuse me, would be expanding and contracting with the weather and you needed to allow them to move back and forth. <coughs> Unfortunately, the weight of the cables was so much that they collapsed these saddles. And the caisson has effectively allowed for enough movement to accomplish the same role. <coughs> And so I'm just going to breeze through this because I know uh, Marcia is going to get nervous if I don't hit. I was supposed to hit 720, but number of images, 252 images in the book, uh, drawings, woodcuts, photographs. Superstructure. And the railway, they had a railway, a cable car that went back and forth across the bridge. William Payne, who uh, invented the device that allowed the cable cars to grab onto the cable without uh, a herky-jerky motion. And so let me just play for you this video. This is from 1899, showing the bridge in operation. You see the promenade, which of course was unique and still exists today, but no motorcycle, um, excuse me, bicycles on the promenade. And you see that they, because of demand, have added trolleys to the outside to supplement the railway there. And so the opening, May 24th, 1883, huge crowds, President of the United States, John Roebling watching over the whole thing, posthumously, uh, Mayor Seth Lowe greeting the president, et cetera, et cetera. And so here we are, the jacket for my book, the blurbs on the back of the book. And so I just wanted to share with you uh, this wonderful blurb written by Kurt Anderson, uh, used to host Studio 360 on WNYC. If you love Brooklyn or bridges or New York City or cities or 19th century marble, marvels or all of the above, building the Brooklyn Bridge is a perfect feast, a would-be traveler's delight, overflowing with rare and evocative and fascinating images it's a terrific book. And so let's see if you have some questions now. Jeff, wow. I, I love this image of the, 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 the thrill seekers walking on the footbridge. Mm. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's wonderful. So we have lots of great questions and thank you all for your questions. Um, and some of them are about financing and engineering and other things, but I'm going to start with the human questions, um, the ones about the people. And because this question was asked multiple times, let's start with Emily. Um, people really want to know a little bit more about her role, what she did. Yes, uh, I think her role is unfortunately being a bit overstated at this point. Uh, I just read an article that someone sent me which described her as the chief engineer of the bridge, which is not accurate. Uh, she was undoubtedly a very, very smart and personable human being. Uh, she took over for Washington Roebling when he could not meet his assistant engineers, his six assistant engineers face to face. And so she's the one who went to the bridge site and she's the one who reported undoubtedly back to Washington Roebling as to what had gone on. And she's the one who he would sit with and explain what had to be done. And she would make sure that it 
got done. But she was not sitting there doing engineering calculations. Uh, and so her contribution was tremendously valuable. Uh, she uh, was very much his partner on the bridge. And, you know, uh, I do slightly take umbrage at the fact that there's now an Emily Roebling Park and that there's no a Washington Roebling Park. And so certainly he was the primary person behind it and he was the chief engineer. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk a little bit about the, the workers uh, and who, who they were. And one particular question asks, have you seen any evidence of people of color working on the bridge? Uh, that's actually fascinating. Uh, people of color, I did not see it until late on my work in the book. So you're dealing with various formats of photographs. And so I had a lantern slide and then a stereo view of the same image. And lo and behold, the stereo view, this man of color is not visible there just because of the size of the image that they are reproducing. But then when you look at the lantern slide of the exact same image, he has not been cropped out because of the size of a lantern slide. And so, in fact, you'll be able to see in the appendix, which discovers uh, discusses the photographers and the photographs, that I did discover this man of color there. Now, it's unclear. I can't say that he's a worker, although it appears that he was. He could have been someone passing by uh, as the photograph was being taken. Mm -hmm. With respect to the workers, the workers, many were Civil War veterans just because of the era. Many were immigrants, uh, many Irish immigrants who worked on the bridge. Uh, the work itself was not terribly attractive. They were, when they were working in the caissons, they were turning over about one third of the workforce every week. Uh, it paid well. And Washington Roebling, I quote as saying, we never had a problem getting people to work on the bridge. There was a strike during the course of the construction and they got a slight raise and then the threats started and they came back to work. Talk a little bit, we have one question about how many worker, if you know, how many workers perished during the bridge's construction. Obviously you've talked about how dangerous it was. Right, it's kind of a ballpark of 30 who, who died. And so some of that was the bend, some of that was that woodcut that we saw where a, uh, a, a wire snapped and two men were thrown off the top of the anchorage to their death. And so uh, yeah, the rough numbers, there are not precise numbers on a lot of things. Uh, sometimes you read that the cables are 15 inches across and sometimes 15 and a half. And sometimes the number of wires per cable, one you know, official says one thing and one says another. So they, you know, typical of the 19th century were not keeping careful records of everybody who died and everybody who was injured in the construction. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for a couple more questions. We'll go a few minutes over. Um, about financing, how did New York pay for the bridge issued bonds? Do you, can you speak to that? Uh, I could not get into the scandals that were associated with the bridge. McCullough does an excellent job on that, Boss Tweed was of course involved, one of our permanent residents of Greenwood Cemetery. And where Boss Tweed was, one can suspect that something was going on. Uh, William Kingsley, who's also at Greenwood, was the general superintendent. And his gravestone is in fact a stone from the Brooklyn Bridge, which is pretty great. Uh, he was, according to McCullough, something of a bagman handing out cash when needed. So New York City and Brooklyn purchased stock in the bridge. 
it was a private organization chartered by New York State in order to do this. Uh, there were private stockholders. Kingsley was one of the big stockholders. And so there, there were issues with respect to the payment. The, the lure was that they would charge uh, people to get across the bridge. And so, for instance, there was a scale for pigs and sheep and cattle and carriages and even pedestrians. The opening day, you had to pay one cent to get across the bridge. And then there was a big push to eliminate that. And so that quickly went by the boards as to pedestrians, but not as to others. And so the lure was in terms of investing that the bridge would pay for itself in just a few years. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's, let's just do two more quick questions. Um, I like this one as a sort of wrap up. Um, when you step back and think about doing the book, uh, did you discover anything that surprised you? about the bridge? Hmm, anything that surprised me. Uh, what surprised me big picture was the overall cutting edge technology and absolutely primitiveness of the construction. And so this is the first bridge that is all steel, but yet the idea of this big box floating down the East River into place uh, is just, to my mind, you know, not cutting edge, even though in the 19th century, this huge caisson was the biggest such feature that had come along. So you've got this mix of the primitive and the most modern. Amazing, really, what an amazing collection. Um, and I, I'll end with, uh, I have two that I really want to ask. So let's just, let's, speaking of the collection, someone wants to know whether you're planning to donate your collection to a museum. Um, my collection's already been donated to the Greenwood Historic Fund. Beautiful. And um, because I bet there's a whole lot of people wondering the same thing, Susan asks, please describe the tools that are behind you. <laughs> oh. I used to go up to Maine quite a bit. And so uh, I would go to antique stores and tool shops and that sort of thing. And I would buy things. So uh, you're probably seeing eel spears and draw knives. And those feet are for drying uh, silk uh, socks or stockings so that they don't shrink. And uh, we've got a hammer over here to uh, knock the uh, ice and snow out of the hoofs of horses. So uh, there are many, many different tools, a lot of eel spears here. Um, I'm looking a hat stretcher. So yeah, a, a lot of uh, things. Unfortunately, I've run out of wall space. So <laughs> that's become a problem. <laughs> I think it's material for another book. Cool. Yeah, it cool. could be. It could be. <laughs> Let's sell this one first. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, as as I said at the beginning, the book is how the Brooklyn Bridge was built. No, I'm sorry. That's the name of the program. Um, the book is building the Brooklyn Bridge, 1869 to 1883. Um, the corrected book link is in the chat. Um, to explore it more at the community bookstore webpage uh, and perhaps purchase it uh, an advanced copy in advance, which is sort of special. Um, and Jess, I can't thank you enough. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. There's so much we could go on for another hour, <laughs> clearly. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, your wealth of knowledge is, is a treasure in and of itself. And thanks for sharing it all. Oh, well, thank you so much for this opportunity and being such a gracious host. I appreciate it. I want to let everybody know that the program was recorded and it will be posted tomorrow on the Center for Brooklyn History's YouTube channel. There will, I think, be a link to that post, uh, uh, that channel, there you go, uh, in the chat. Um, and please explore our other programs. We have programs, many programs um, every week presented by the library, Brooklyn BPL Presents and 
uh, at least weekly from the Center for Brooklyn History. Uh, I hope that you'll come to many more talks and um, join us for those virtually and someday gathering in person again. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jeff. Have a good night. Thanks again. Good night now.